Good morning. Feels like church in here, huh? That was great. That was special. The Spirit was here and remains here. Amen. The Word tells us that. It just takes two or more gathered in His name. Actually, it just takes one, right? Because the Holy Spirit dwells within those who call on Jesus as Lord and Savior, right? Amen. So He's here. He's with us powerfully, and we're excited about that. Part of why we come together every week is to celebrate His goodness, to fellowship with each other, and share stories of how He's worked in our lives. My name is Jeff, by the way. If I haven't met you, I'm one of the crew here at Crossroads. Uh, it's my privilege to be able to share the word a bit with you all this morning as we continue on in our series, uh, Like a Child. And you may be new to the whole Advent adventure. If you are, welcome to it, because we're not yet in the Christmas season. Like throwaway popular Western American culture, Christmas is not from Black Friday to December 25th. All right, that's a lie. I know everyone's like, What? Uh, that's true, though. The Christmas season actually doesn't begin until December 25th, and then it proceeds for what are known as the 12 days of Christmas. We won't sing the song. I'll spare you, spare you that. We don't have like half an hour to spare for it. Uh, but the 12 days of Christmas start on Christmas and proceed through the New Year to the day of Epiphany on January 6th, which is the time that commemorates the Magi or the wise men coming to Bethlehem to celebrate the birth of Jesus, right? So we're in like the, the pre-party time here. We're in like the season of like preparing our hearts for the party. Yeah, that's what Advent is. It's celebrating the arrival that is yet to come. So we're posturing our hearts through this time together like children in this series to make sure we're ready for the arrival of Jesus. So welcome to Advent if you're new to the whole Advent game. We're glad to have you here with us. And this means, by the way, if you're like, my wife, uh, if you like to celebrate Christmas like into February, seems like, not really, but if you're one of those late celebrators who lets like the Christmas music flow and the decorations stay out until well into the new year, you're actually doing it right according to church tradition, right? Like that's good news. Like, the party's supposed to extend uh, that long and that far and rightly so because it turns out Jesus is a pretty big deal, right? Alrighty, so last week Bethany talked about the story of Samuel and his role as a prophet in the nation of Israel and how he learned, even as a young boy, to sort of tune his ear to hear the voice of the Lord, starting from the time again that he was a youth. Uh, and the big takeaway for me there, if you were here last week, you may remember if you weren't, but for me, it's part of the preparation of getting our hearts ready for Christmas, for us to actually tune ourselves in to hear the voice of the Father. Like, and here's some good news. He still speaks. This is not just like Bible times we read about and God's gone quiet ever since. No, no. Simply because our culture has gone a little bit crazy and a little bit frenetic in its pace so that we can't hear his voice anymore because we're so consumed with everything else going on does not mean he stopped speaking, right? So here's some advice from an older guy. I'm getting old. I got lots of gray coming in here. My son's always like, you got a lot of gray in your beard. I'm like, thanks, buddy. I see you there. It's true, I do have a lot of gray in my beard. But if you want some advice coming into how to prepare your heart for the Christmas season, or just generally, slow down. If you're like, God doesn't speak to me, slow down. He does speak. So part of the encouragement of Advent and part of what we learn from the story of Samuel is if we can slow ourselves down and not get stuck in this like cultural mire that we're all part of here and carve out time and space, whether that's you know, a daily rhythm of being in the Word or seeking the Lord through prayer, whether that's through celebrating weekly Sabbath rest with friends and family and other believers, whether that's through a monthly rhythm of going on retreat, if we will carve out space for the Lord to speak, He will speak. We just have to take the time to listen. It turns out listening is something we have to do actively. Like you can't speed up the process of a conversation by listening harder. Like it takes what it takes. It takes time. It takes space. We learn that from the prophet Samuel. So build some rhythms into your life this season. Slow down. Let the Lord speak as you prepare your heart for his coming. Now the story of Samuel, as it turns out, intersects uh, pretty neatly with the next story we're going to talk about in our series here 
like a child because we're going to look at the young shepherd from Bethlehem, David. And we first meet David in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, we know that he is the youngest of eight sons. There's a couple of uh, sisters as well involved, but there's eight brothers in this family. He's from Bethlehem. He's a shepherd. And Samuel is actually sent to town, to the town of Bethlehem, with a word from the Lord. So what a prophet does is deliver what the Lord says to do and to say. He's gone to Bethlehem on purpose to anoint the future king of Israel. Now, this is slightly awkward because there's already a king over Israel. His name is Saul. But the Lord's displeased with Saul for a number of reasons. So he says there's going to be a new king who's going to establish a throne over Israel that I will make an everlasting throne. And we know from the scriptural narrative that that person ends up being David and the Messiah himself. Jesus comes through the line of King David. Now, some debate on how old David was at this time, at this encounter. I've read some scholars say he was as young as eight years old, which seems a little bit young or a lot of it young, if you're going to anoint someone as a king over a nation. Uh, I've heard 10 years old thrown out as an option. We know, though, factually, David could not have been older than 15. And we know this because of some Bible math. You ready for some Bible math? Everyone's like, Lord, have mercy. No, we're not ready for Bible math. Okay, so to serve in the military in Israel, you had to be 20 years old at this time, according to the book of Numbers. We know this for sure. We also know from the text that three of David's brothers are active duty in the Israeli military. That means three of eight are of service age, which means five of the eight are not of military age. You following so far? So if three are 20 or above and five are below the age of 20, and we got to get five deep to get to David. Let's say there's a 19-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 17-year-old, a 16-year-old, David at 15. And that's like generous. You think that they were having a son per year? I mean, maybe, right? Like scripture is silent on that point, could have been, but in all likelihood, at least there's a good argument to be made that David was actually younger than this. He could have been 12, he could have been 11, he could have been 13. He is young. Like we can land on that conclusion, right? Like my son sitting here, he's 10. I'm not about to give him the keys to our household. Like, hey, run this ship, buddy. No, it's not going to work out. But that's what the Lord does here through the prophet Samuel to David. Now, this is really unusual and really surprising to David and to everybody else. Uh, there was no expectation that David was going to be the one, even in Samuel's eyes, because we have this exchange in 1 Samuel chapter 16 between the Lord and Samuel, because Samuel's like, oh, this must be the one. The Lord says, nope. I don't judge things the way that you see them, Samuel. God says to Samuel here. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. This is a powerful, powerful verse. See, we generally evaluate and even place value on people according to externals. We've talked about this before when we went through Psalm 23 some months ago. And age is one of these variables that we use to assign value. Too old, too young. But the internal, we find, is much more significant, much more meaningful according to the word. And we see this reflected here at the beginning of David's story. The one who was presumed to be the least based on his age is the one that the Lord sees fit to anoint. So the Lord tells Samuel, David's the one. And in obedience, Samuel responds, as we read about a little later in the chapter, as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he'd brought to anoint, and he anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Now, can we stop just for a moment and notice the significance of this verse? Because I think sometimes we read past this, we think that David's like exploits and his accomplishments and his faithfulness and his military achievements and his established rule are like attributed to his own natural sort of prowess. It's true, David exhibits a strength of character even from a young age, but this is the pivotal point here. How does David accomplish what David accomplishes throughout his reign? Because the Spirit of the Lord anointed him for the task. I pray, church, this becomes the mark for us. That the Spirit's anointing comes on us. Why? Because that's when the Lord gets the glory. That's when he works in and through his people. When the Spirit's at work, buckle up. 
It turns out, too, as we follow the story in David's journey, this mark, this anointing he receives, this empowerment from the Spirit sort of becomes his calling card. In fact, when you turn the page one time to 1 Samuel chapter 17, you run into the story that's familiar probably to many here, if not all, whether you are familiar with the church or you're new to church or new to the Bible or know the Bible, it's the story of David's confrontation with Goliath, which even popular culture, we talk about this sort of stuff. Like It's a real David and Goliath story. Like even the sports world uses that sort of metaphor. It's drawn out of the scriptural text. So if you don't have a Bible, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 17 this morning. There are Bibles up here on the stage you can grab. There's Bibles back there. Uh, grab one of those. If you don't own a Bible, take that. Make it your own. It's a gift to you. You can keep it. In fact, if you know someone this holiday season who doesn't have a Bible, take an extra one or two and give those Bibles away to those folks so they have access to the Word as well. If you're online, send us a note if you need a Bible. We'll mail one to you. Okay, so 1 Samuel chapter 17 starts like this. The Philistines, okay, we're going to have to pause after two words, right? The Philistines, who are the Philistines? They're coastal invaders who have come into the land around the same time that the Israelites came into the land, except they came across the Mediterranean Sea and established a presence on the coastal plain, whereas the Israelites came up around the east, across the Jordan at Jericho, right? So two different ends of the country, two people groups sort of jockeying and vying for position and supremacy within the promised land, right? That's the Philistines. Philistines mustered their army for battle and camped between Soko and Judah and Azekah at Ephes Damim. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the Valley of Elah. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley sitting in between them. Now, that's a lot of geography here. It's easy for us to read past this stuff, like get to the good stuff where the fight happens. This is part of the good stuff because we have to understand what's going on in the conflict and what the stakes are here to truly understand what's happening in the story of David and Goliath. So I'm going to take you on a little geographical journey you're welcome for that. Bible, math, and geography all in one day. It's great. Uh, to sort of show you why this matters, why this battle is even taking place. Because we want to make sure we root ourselves as Bible readers to the actual context of the story that we're reading, right? We want to place ourselves into that time and space and understand what's going on dynamically. So this is a major problem, this whole Philistine like showing up in the Elah Valley, because quite literally it's a matter of national security for the nation of Israel. Let me explain briefly what I mean by this. When the Israelites first came into the land and subdued most of it, it was allocated among the various tribes of Israel. There's 12 tribes. Each tribe, except for the Levites, gets an allotment of land and it's supposed to look something like this, okay? You got some tribes who are given land on the east side of the Jordan River. You have some tribes up here in the north near the Sea of Galilee. And you got some tribes centrally located here and then the southern tribes, Judah and Simeon, down here, right? Each tribe gets an allotment based on its size. The characteristics of each piece of land are different. We don't have time to talk about all that. But it's supposed to function as a uh, sort of a unifying country that also has small tribal units that exist independent of one another as well. So plenty of space, plenty of opportunity for these tribes to grow into this area, to subdue it, to force out people groups that shouldn't be there. This is supposed to be Israel's land on the whole, right? Here's the problem, though. By the time that Saul enters the arena and they get a king over Israel, the land that Israel actually occupied is represented here by this green territory. Do you see the deficiency here? Here's the allotment. The green is what's actually under Israeli control. That's a major problem. Yeah? Imagine, for example, you're the tribes of Ephraim or Benjamin, located here centrally in the country. What happens if this whole coastal plain that's supposed to be controlled by Dan and Judah is instead controlled by the Philistines, which is what we see represented here? Uh-oh. Now we have an enemy at our doorstep with a ready and available pathway into the interior of your country. That's a big, big, big problem. It has to be solved. And the Philistines are a burr in Israel's saddle for hundreds of years. Right? There's lots we could talk about there. Now the Philistines have their eyes set on this incursion moving further into the interior of Israel's land because they stand to benefit greatly economically by doing so. 
There's access to additional trade routes. And just like today, if you control the trade routes and the tax base, you control all those dollar bills, right? And if you control all the dollar bills, then you have an advantage economically, you get an advantage militarily. Like, they're about expanding their footprint in Israel and pushing the Jewish people out so that they can have the upper hand. You see the importance of this staging ground now as we talk about the context here? Here's another view. This helps a little bit. Sometimes two-dimensional maps fall short. Here's a 3D rendering of the nation of Israel from the southwest. Here's the coastal plain all down here. You can ignore all the place names. We're going to talk about all those things. Coastal plain is down here. It's supposed to be occupied by the Israelis. It's not. Instead, the Philistines are there, establishing cities like Ashdod and Ashkelon, Gaza. And now they're moving up this valley system, the Elah Valley, over the foothills called the Shephelah here, with their eyes set on getting up into this ridge here that moves from north to south in the country, right? The interior central mountains of Israel, the heartbeat of Israel, where Saul's capital is up in here, Bethlehem, where David's from, is here. So this is some life or death stuff for the nation of Israel. Why does Saul move against the Philistines? Because he knows what's at stake here. So let me take you to the actual battlefield, the Valley of Elah. We were just there in Israel last month. This is a picture from the ancient ruins of Azekah. It's where we're standing. This whole valley system is the Valley of Elah. So the Philistines would have been camped out all through here in the foreground. You can see the interior mountains of Israel back here on the horizon. Elah Valley, big flat open space in the middle. And Saul brings his troops out of the interior, camps here across from the Philistines, waiting for a showdown here in the valley, right? So this actually happens. Like, I love this about the Bible. It happens in real time, in real space. These are real events, verifiable by real geographic and archaeological study, right? It's not just myth we're talking about. This is a real story that took place in this location. And here, okay, one more view, sorry. So I told you I was a nerd with this stuff. Here's an overhead view. So here's Azeka where I just took that picture. The Philistines come from the coastal plain down here into this valley system. And if they're not stopped, they have free reign up here into the interior of Jerusalem. Make sense? See that plain out here? Now the Philistines are happy to engage Israel in the valley because they have superior technology. They've got chariots, they have heavy infantry, the Israelites are like, we're not going to engage you down here. We're going to sit at the base of the mountain because we know you're trying to come up into the interior. So we're going to use uh, the terrain to our advantage. We're just going to sit and wait, right? So we have this sort of stalemate taking place as we move on into the text. In Goliath, this is verse 4 now in chapter 17. A Philistine champion from Gath, he came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and carried a bronze javelin. That's a lot of bronze. The shaft of the spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spear that weighed 15 pounds. That is an enormous spear. Likely had a counterweight on the back as well to help balance it for throwing. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. So we have here listed this huge, like, string of technological uh, uh, advantages that Goliath has at his disposal here, including another human being carrying his shield out front. Verse 8, Goliath stood and he shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I'm the Philistine champion, but you're only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, we'll be your slaves, but if I kill him, you'll be ours. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. I mean, a nine-footer, I'd be pretty scared too. But this is not a great look for King Saul. He's the one who we know stands head and shoulders above the rest of his kin. He's the one who's been anointed of the Lord to lead Israel into battle. He's the one who's a seasoned shoulder, a grown man. He's supposed to be the one who takes up this cause for the nation. But we find a lack of courage here for Saul and no indication in the text that he takes this fear before the Lord. No indication in the text that he devises any meaningful strategy or plan to help eliminate this threat. Nothing. Just fear and that's it. 
Skipping ahead to verse 16, we read that for 40 days, every morning and evening, so 80 times now, the Philistine champion strutted out in front of the Israelite army. He's trying to goad them into a fight into the valley system where they have the advantage. Trying to bait them in, right? Now, this is a long time to have battle lines drawn up. It would have taken a ton of provisions to sustain this, both for Israel and for the Philistines. And the length of the standoff here speaks to the stakes that we're talking about. Like both countries here, both people groups understand this is like a once and for all sort of affair here. Like whoever wins here wins the interior. Like it's that significant that they would sit for 40 days, Israel would waiting for the Philistines to try to move. And for 40 days, the Philistine invaders would try to go to Israel and do a fight here. It's going to define the power structure in the land uh, for quite some time moving forward. So one day, Jesse from Bethlehem up there in the interior mountains said to David, hey, take this basket of grain and these loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. Give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how they're doing. Bring me back a report. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelites, uh, the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines, or at least lining up against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and he set out early the next morning. It's only it's less than a day's walk from Bethlehem to the battle line. Again, you see how far this incursion has come into Israelite territory. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and with battle cries. Soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army, as they've done for, you know, 40 days. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies. He hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The kings offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He'll give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. Now here, finally in the text, we get a glimpse into Saul's perspective. This is his proposed solution to the problem, not a consultation with the Lord, not to go fight the battle for himself as the leader of Israel, but to sweeten the pot for someone else to go address the problem, right? And it is a sweet pot. Like, imagine, for example, your entire family being exempted from any tax forever. Someone said amen, I heard it. Like, that's a big deal, right? It's a big deal depending on your tax bracket in particular, but that's a big deal. An even bigger deal is the second piece to this, a reward of marrying into the royal family. Like that is not a joke. Like that sets up your family for generations. Like Saul is serious about someone else being encouraged and incentivized to come and take care of this Philistine problem. So David asked the soldier standing nearby, what's the man gonna get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan, uncircumcised Philistine anyway that he's allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And the men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, this is the reward for killing him. Now, skipping forward to verse 32, we see David now takes up his cause with King Saul directly. He says, hey, don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. To which Saul's like, sure you will. Like, don't be ridiculous, Saul replied, which is how I would respond probably too in the moment. Like, that's absurd. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, 15, 12 maybe. And Goliath has been a man of war since his youth. He's a trained soldier. We talked about all the technology he has at his, as it is at his employ, right? David goes on to explain his confidence. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. And Saul's like, whoopee. <laughs> And David continues, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club. I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. I've done this to both lions and the bears. I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Now, I love the brazen confidence of David here, right? And let's do a little compare and contrast between David and Saul and their perspectives. From a worldly point of view, all the confidence should have been with Saul. 
All the courage should have, should have been with Saul, again, the sitting king, a trained warrior, the Lord's anointed, the one who's bigger and stronger than the rest of Israel. He's the natural choice to take on Goliath. But he lacked something that David had. You know what it was? Courage, yes. Specifically driven by the power of the Spirit who came upon him powerfully at his anointing. So instead of Saul being filled with courage and moving forward, we see Saul shrinking back and David, a mere child, stepping forward with a degree of courage that's only possible through the Lord's presence in his life. This is the thing that marks David's leadership, courage and the Lord's anointing. This is why David later on, after all his trials and all his adversity and all the stuff that he had to, to walk through on his way to ascending the throne of Israel, writes in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the deepest, darkest, most dangerous valley, the valley of the shadow of death, I need not live in fear or be fearful of evil. Why? Because I know the Lord is with me. That's what he stakes his life on time and time again. And time and time again, the Lord delivers because that's who he is. That's the sense David's bringing to this encounter also. Saul unknowingly sort of affirms what's already going on behind the scenes. Go ahead, Saul finally says. And may the Lord be with you. Little does he know the Lord already is with David, right? The Lord's working in and through David to bring about his purposes. And Saul gave David his own armor, more bronze, David put it on, strapped the sword over it, took a step or two to see what it was like, for he'd never worn such a thing again because he's not a trained warrior. He's still a youth. And here we see Saul again trying to match tech for tech with Goliath, right? Still not a reliance on the Lord here. I can't go on these, David protests. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up instead five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Now, something here to point out as well. It seems like David's at a pretty distinct disadvantage here. Wouldn't he? Like if you're going to put a bet on this uh, like battle outcome from an, like a, a, just a worldly perspective, got to go with Goliath. Like I don't know what the odds are. They're not good for a little shepherd boy with no armament facing a trained warrior in the valley, no less. But the Lord has a way of doing this, not just in this story, but over and over again in the Old Testament and even into the New. Of using the weak to lead the strong, of taking humility and exalting it, of purposely putting his people at a disadvantage from a worldly perspective so that when victory is accomplished, he alone gets the glory for it. It's like his specialty. Gideon, David, over and over again, these stories that we think about in the Old Testament have this sort, of, uh, uh, this sort of lesson attached to them. So Goliath walks out towards David, the shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He roars at David. Did you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. And we could spend quite a bit of time, if we had the time, talking about the Philistine gods here, gods plural, Dagon and some others, because we have another sort of compare and contrast being shown in the story here. It's not just a battle between flesh of David and flesh of Goliath. It's actually a battle between the God of Israel and the God of the Bible and the pagan gods of the pagan world represented by the Philistines. There's spiritual connection going on here that's way more significant than the flesh and blood reality we see on the page. And David, once again, demonstrates knowledge here, both knowledge and courage, that goes way beyond his ears. And I love, love, love his reply. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I'll kill you and cut off your head. And then I'll give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know there's a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know the Lord rescues his people, not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. 
I don't know if you were counting there, but that's six references to the Lord in three short verses. You think David understands, even at this young age, who the real champion of this battle is going to be? He does. It's not him. It's the Lord. Again, David has courage. David has wisdom. And both here are rightly applied. And I love verse 47 in particular. The Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. Don't we still believe that to be true today, followers of Jesus? We absolutely do, because that's absolutely correct. We have been rescued ourselves through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Not by might, not by power, by his grace. Amen? It's not through military might. It's through the movement of God. And Jesus came that through his suffering and his death and his victory over it, we too could be invited into eternal life with him as victors through him. This is where the intersection starts to be felt between the story of David and the story of Christmas, this Advent season. Because David has it exactly right in his context. And we also are invited to get it right in our context. How do we inherit eternal life? How are we saved? How are we rescued from sin, death, and hell? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's it. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Again, entering into the valley system. He quickly ran out. He reached into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. Wow. Like, what a, what a turn. Like, what? And here's where some, uh, some, some, some history about David's weaponry will maybe come in handy for you as a reader. Because we sometimes view this as like David rolled out with a slingshot from Walmart. Like Dennis the Menace, right? And his red overalls and like a couple of pebbles. Like, that's not actually the case. The weapon that David employed was an Israelite sling that looks something like this. It's probably made fully of leather as opposed to this one being of twine. When whirled overhead like this and released, or when whirled underhand like this, low pitch softball and released, the kill radius for an Israelite slinger was 450 feet. The kill radius for Goliath with his giant superhuman spear, 250 feet tops. And the stones that David gathered from the stream, I was able to go to that same stream the last time we were in Israel a handful of years ago. They were stones about like yay, yeah? We're talking two to three inches in diameter. David picked all the round ones out. He left me these ones, so this is the best I could grab. But a round stone like this, right? This is an archaeological uh, recovery from the town of Lachish, which was burned down during the Assyrian uh, or Babylonian, I can't remember which one, invasion of Israel, in the same region of the Elah Valley, right? These stones were recovered. This is the technology David employs. And it's lethal when used properly. So David's first sling is all it takes, right? The first one strikes true. Goliath goes down like a sack of potatoes. As an aside, by the way, like, Where's Goliath the shield bearer? The guy's got one job. Like, literally, just don't let Goliath get picked off from long range. That's your one thing. Like, well, maybe a bird was chirping. He's sort of like, uh, Goliath goes down. He's like, uh-oh. Like, I'm, I'm, who knows? I'm glad for the outcome of the battle, but I've always been perplexed by that. So it's like, if he survived, it's time for a career change for this guy, right? Let's just... Anyway, so David triumphs over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. He used it to kill him and cut off his head. After this, the Philistines flee. Israel wins an amazing victory. Uh, they loot the, the, the plunder from the Philistines as they travel back out of the valley system. The Lord brings about this amazing victory through David, the shepherd boy from Bethlehem. It's incredible, right? Uh, it doesn't seem very Christmassy, though. Like, really? Like a decapitation? But there is a lesson here. There is a lesson here for us 
as well. And I think the main lesson to be drawn out both for this story of David and Goliath and for the promise that's made to us through the arrival of Jesus is this. The Lord can use anyone from any place or any purpose he designs. That's good news. That's really good news. Whether you're young or old or not qualified or not capable in your own eyes, through Jesus, you are in fact qualified and capable. That's what the word tells us. If a shepherd boy can take down a giant with a sling, the Lord can use you right where he has you. And that's his intention for you and his intention for me. To be his hands and his feet in a world that's gone terribly awry, to bring light into darkness, to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, right? This is what Jesus tells us. This is our charge as God's followers and as disciples of Jesus. See, we often limit ourselves based on human perspective. And we need to rebuke sometimes, like what Samuel received from the Lord in 1 Samuel chapter 16 when he goes to anoint the future king. We say that I'm too old or I'm too young or I'm not equipped, I'm not capable, I'm not smart enough, pretty enough, strong enough, I don't have the resources, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy, and on and on we go. We're so busy defining ourselves by what we don't have, we fail actually to pay attention to what's been offered to us through Christ, which is the presence and power of the literal God of the universe. And if God is for us, who can stand against us, the word tells us? No one comes to the answer. Amen? So are we going to struggle with fear? Sure. Are we going to face obstacles? Absolutely. The courage is moving forward in faith in spite of those things. Trusting in the God who can save and preserve in spite of whatever the odds look like. And the word tells us the Holy Spirit will give us what we need to walk this out in faith, just as he did for David. So I don't know what situations you're facing. I don't know what this Advent season brings up for you or what the holiday season looks like for you. Can we just take a breath and recognize that Jesus came to redeem all of this and all of us? And we can posture ourselves in the weeks leading up to Christmas to actually believe that stuff and to allow him space to speak into those times where we're fearful, to speak into those times where we don't understand what's going on, to speak into those times where we feel overwhelmed, speak into those times where we face natural limitations. Good. It's good that we face those limitations. It gives God a chance to show up and it gives God a chance to demonstrate and take credit for what only God can do, Right? So there's opportunity here for the Lord to show up, for us to demonstrate childlike faith and courage in who he is, just as David did. There's opportunity for us to develop greater trust in him. There's opportunity for us to pray that the Spirit will infuse us with wisdom and courage, as he did with David. And this is what we look forward to in the coming of Messiah. Jesus, the one who comes from the same lineage who comes from a real underdog sort of environment himself, a strange birth narrative, a strange family of origin, all kinds of stuff that's seen as a weakness for him. He is God's anointed, the one chosen to redeem all of creation to himself. So for me, this helps my heart to remember this as we head into the Christmas season on the after, in the afterside, the afterside? After the Advent season. Because when we let this season actually do its work, we find that Christmas becomes all the richer for us because his coming actually changes everything for us. And he changes it always for good. It's who he is. So do you lack courage this morning? Okay, acknowledge that before the Lord. Let him speak into those places. Create space. Through the Holy Spirit, begin to draw towards the Lord because when the Lord's presence is with us, we find courage easier to grab hold of. Amen? At least I do. So as we continue on in the Advent season, preparing our hearts for the arrival of Jesus and the start of Christmas, may the Lord bless and keep you.
May he make his face shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and be gracious to you. He grants you his peace. And why? So you'll live in the light of his presence. So your heart will be filled with courage through the Holy Spirit. And so you'll trust in him with all that you are.